I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak at this event today. This is one of the best ways to battle genocide denial. I would also like to use this opportunity to thank other speakers, uh, genocide scholars, activists, both international and Bosnian. And I'm aware that they dedicated significant part of their life to prove genocide in Bosnia and to battle genocide denial. So I thank them as a Bosnian and I believe on behalf of all of us. The past, as the American, uh, as the famous writer L.P. Hartley once remarked, is a foreign country. They do things differently there. It's not possible to live in the past. We are all aware of that. However, we have to face it. But denial of the past is different. It lives in the present. The denial of genocide that exists today in Bosnia and Herzegovina casts a dark cloud over its future and prevents the reconciliation process. Denial has many forms. Well-known academics have given this topic the attention it deserves. This is the final stage of genocide and the so-called normal practice of genocidiaries. It is generally associated with Jewish Holocaust, yet each genocide in history has been followed with complex denial strategies. Some of, those, some of those strategies, and we are aware of those strategies in Bosnia, are to blame the victim. Another one is, for example, to justify the causes of the violence. The third one is to set genocide in intentionally wrong historical context. And these are just a few. There are many ways to deny genocide and many strategies that denialists use. Israel Chani mentions one of the strategies used in academia, that is to insist on proving endlessly what the facts are and claiming that we do not know enough to establish historical facts. Even when we know plenty, we still don't know enough. That is uh, one of the ways uh, some academics who wrote about genocide in Bosnia denied it. Bosnia is an example of failed genocide prevention in 1992, but it is also an example of a muddled transitional justice process. That transitional justice process is actually so muddled that allowed for the denial to become a norm. Denial in Bosnia is not a deviation. It is part of the everyday media and political discourse, particularly in Republika Srpska and Serbia. The trials and judgments of the ICTY and the state court represent a very important historical archive. I used to criticize the Hague Tribunal, and I still do sometimes. But those trials and judgments, and especially documents used in those trials, can be very effective strategy to deconstruct genocide denial. However, so far, they confirm that the only genocide committed in Bosnia is the one in Srebrenica. Not everything is finished yet. We're yet to see whether the trials of Radovan Karadžić and Ratko Mladic will prove genocide for 1992. The question of intent, or in the case of genocide, special genocide intent, sometimes is understood as part of a broader argument concerning which cases of mass violence are entitled to be labeled genocide and which are not. So the Serbian genocide against Bosnian Muslims from 1992 to 1995 is often highlighted in this debate and is often used as an example in a broader academic discussion about genocide. When it comes to Bosnia, authors differ in their interpretation of the conflict. Some call it genocide, while others call it ethnic cleansing. Those who claim Bosnia and Herzegovina did not experience genocide from 1992 till 1995, until Srebrenica, they emphasize the lack of genocidal intent on the part of the Serb and Bosnian Serb perpetrators. Michael Mann, for example, Commenting on the judgment imposed on Radoslav Krstic, who was found guilty of genocide in Srebrenica, says, I quote, I would prefer to call this 
a local genocidal outburst set amidst a broader murderous cleansing of Muslims, which was too erratic and regionally varied to be called genocide. Both finished. Also, it is often implied that the events in Srebrenica were an inevitable result of the campaign of ethnic violence. But a distinction is made between the nature of that campaign and the genocide in July 1995. In international law and policy make, making, we are aware that terminology and semantics matter. They matter a lot, especially during the conflict. The term ethnic cleansing allowed for a relativization of guilt and accommodation of the idea that all sides are equally guilty. We're all familiar with the notion of ancient hatreds, idea that Bosnian people have hated themselves for, this, for, century, for centuries and that the war uh, that started in 1992 is kind of a natural continuation of those hatreds. And this scenario and this interpretation of genocide and the aggression on Bosnia and Herzegovina was ideal for the non-interventionist politics of the UN. For is everybody is guilty, there is nobody to punish, there is nothing to prevent, and no one simply has to get their hands dirty. After all, Ethnic cleansing, unlike genocide, does not call world government to honor the mandate imposed on them by the Genocide Convention of 1948. And the Genocide Convention, according to it, they have to prevent it and end it by any means necessary. Florence Hartmann mentioned Ambassador Diego Aria, and I will mention him again. In 1993, the term slow motion genocide was introduced by Ambassador Aria. He led the Security Council delegation to Srebrenica at the end of April that year. Aria, as we also heard from Hassan, observed thousands of refugees living on the streets, witnessed Serbs forces denying them access to food, and saw that they were exposed to sniper fire and shelling on a daily basis. According to Genocide Convention, that is genocide. At that time, forensic evidence for mass graves in eastern and northwestern Bosnia had not been discovered yet. Arias' impression in the spring of 1993 was that Bosnian Muslims in Srebrenica were being prepared for mass slaughter. And unfortunately, he was right. What he called a slow motion genocide escalated in July 1995. But when Aria coined the term slow motion genocide, he did not know that mass graves with victims from the 1992 violence had already littered eastern and northwestern Bosnia by the time he visited Srebrenica. The mass executions that took place in Srebrenica in July 1995 had already been carried out in other towns throughout the region three years before. Those early events were presented by the European media as uncontrolled violence perpetrated by rogue paramilitaries. As we said already, ancient <coughs> hatreds and ethnic cleansing, and all sides are equally guilty. So that, that was it how it was presented in European but also in American media. Yet transcripts of the Republika Srpska Assembly, the para-state body essentially legitimized by Dayton at the war's end, show that genocidal rhetorics was a norm. Talk of the extermination of Bosnian Muslims was everyday discourse for Bosnian Serb so-called parliamentarians. At one of those sessions, for example, the delegate from Prijedor, Srdo Srdić, who boasted in 1993 that they had wiped Prijedor clean, that it is no longer a green Muslim municipality, said, I quote, we fix them and send them packing, thinking they fixed and send them packing Bosnian Muslims. 
Where exactly Serbian military and police forces from Prijedor sent Bosnian Muslims packing was known all along to those who were willing to see the truth. But when exhumations began after the war, it became obvious to everyone else. Still, what took place in Prijedor was not considered genocide among international decision makers, judges in The Hague, or international media, with the exception of The Hague prosecution, which defined uh, in, the in the indictments uh, events in Prijedor as genocide. The exhumations in Prijedor were of a significant number of smaller mass graves, but those small mass graves were apparently not shocking enough to warrant that label. In October 2013, near Prijedor, Tomasica, the largest mass grave, not only in Prijedor, but in the whole of Bosnia, was discovered. And it answered with certainty where Bosnian Muslims from the area of Prijedor were sent packing in the summer of 1992. Just to mention that Tomasica mass grave is in the vicinity of the Serbian village, just short walk to the first houses. As a genocide researcher, I used to get very angry and upset in conversation with denialists in the past. I somehow don't get upset or angry any longer. It is because ICTY trials give abundance of, of evidence that Serbian and Bosnian Serb leadership had intent to destroy Bosnian Muslims as a group long before Srebrenica on the whole territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And now, in conversation with those who deny it, I use that evidence. And it is hard for them to battle that. So, the way to battle the denial, and those in academia who innocently deny, claiming that genocide intent is difficult to prove, is to actually quote them what the perpetrators themselves were planning and openly talking among themselves long before 1995. Perpetrators-based research is the best strategy to counter genocide denial. One only needs to research the archive from the Hague Tribunal or the State Court and read documents whose authenticity do not deny even lawyers of the perpetrators. For example, on May 12, 1992 session, Momčilo Krajšnik, the president of the so-called Parliament of the Bosnian Serbs, read the six Serbian strategic goals. One of the goals is to physically separate the Serbs from other people in Bosnia. And from Professor Robedonia, we've heard in details about other documents and other goals. Radko Mladic is the general who is on trial for genocide in The Hague and not only for genocide in Srebrenica, but in other municipalities as well. On May 12, 1992, after Krajšnik read those six strategic goals, Mladic warned both of them, Krajšnik and Karadžić, that this goal cannot be implemented without committing genocide. Do not have any illusions. Mladic did not have moral concerns about it. He was only worried how will Karadžić and Krajšnik, Krajšnik explain that to the world and what will the world say for their actions and whether that would provoke military intervention. Radovan Karadžić, who is also accused for genocide in Bosnia, did not hide his genocidal intent. There are many instances in which he shared his intent in conversation with his close allies. In October 1991, for example, he told to his brother that there, that there will be a war until their obliteration, that his plan is to first kill all of the leaders of Bosnian Muslims. And if you read more, you will find that genocidal rhetoric was prevalent in the public discourse of Bosnian Serb political and military leaders. Some historical analysis of the events that relies on forensic evidence, mass graves, and witness testimonies, but also on documents that prove that genocidal intent was not hidden somewhere deep in the mind of the perpetrators. It was discussed openly 
at the session of the so-called Bosnian Serb Parliament. So, for you potential young genocide researchers who sit today here, and for others who wonder whether the Bosnian Serb leadership had the intent to destroy the Bosnian Muslim group as such, as early as 1991, I suggest the perpetrators-based research. Instead of conclusion, I invite you to read the following quotes using the Hague Tribunal and to make a conclusion for, the, for yourself. There are only four slides. <laughs> 